right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Spirit of Fire at Home. I'm Pastor Mike May here in the great city of Richmond, Virginia. We want to welcome you all to our online uh, Bible study tonight, what we like to call Spirit of Fire at Home, where we're just relaxed, relaxed environment, just kind of chill. Um, tonight, I want you to go ahead and share this with as many people as you can. Share it on your social media platforms. Get it out to as many people, because I'm going to talk to you about an important subject tonight. I'm going to talk to you about finishing strong. Um, how to finish strong. Um, in this stewardship series, um, God has laid on my heart to deal with the area of stewardship. Um, and I was actually, uh, I think it just meditating on the word. And as I was going through some scripture, just kind of reading and meditating, this came up in my spirit. Um, this can be for the person who no matter, you know, you, you built something or you've worked on things and it seemed like you have setbacks in your life. Um, things just haven't gone the way you planned on it to go. Um, but God says you can finish strong for the person who may just be starting out. I'm going to encourage you how to structure yourself so that you can not only start strong, but finish strong because there'll be things that come up in your life, things that'll try to come up to get you off course, but you can weather the storm and that you can still finish strong. You can start strong and finish strong. And so there are things in your life that I want to help you. I want to just give you some wisdom. I want to just kind of talk to you today. It's kind of like we just sitting in the coffee shop, sitting at a table, just chatting it up, just chopping it up. I want to just talk to you today and just share some practical wisdom with you, some things I've acquired over the years, things I've learned um, in my time living and in ministry. Uh, I've been in spirit-filled ministry now for 20 over 25 years now, and um, just living life, being a husband, being a father. Sometimes you, you, you start out with the right intentions, but things just don't go the way that you originally planned. And sometimes they don't go the way you originally planned because you never set the system in place or develop the disciplines in certain areas of your life to fulfill what it is that you're going out to do. So I want to help you today. I want to, I want to help you um, accomplish and achieve and go after the thing God called you to go after. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. I thank you that revelation knowledge of your word will flow freely from heaven, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. None of me, all of you. Holy Spirit, speak through my vocal cords. Think through my mind to bring wisdom and knowledge and good understanding of your word. We do approach the holy written word reverently, and we thank you for it now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that every ear is anointed to hear, every heart is open and ready to receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our souls. We bless you, and we thank you for it now. In the mighty name of Jesus, that we do pray, praise, and give thanks. Amen and amen. All right. Now, when we are talking about stewardship, stewardship, um, there's a scripture that declares, and it's required of a steward that a man be found faithful. In the book of 1 Corinthians 14, I believe it is, that it's required of every steward that a man be found faithful. To be faithful is for you to be, is for you to have longevity. It's for you to remain steadfast in a particular assignment, a particular thing God called you to do, no matter what has come up. Because for all of us, there's going to be life issues, there's going to be hiccups, bumps in the road stuff that's going to try to stop you from accomplishing and achieving the good life, achieving the purpose, the plan, the pursuit that you have for your life that God created you for. And so I don't want you to, to kind of get rattled when stuff comes up, because like my pastor used to say, you got to plan for potential setbacks in life. There are things that will happen that will come up because life happens to all of us. You know, whether it's a person who's lost a job, um, the death of a loved one, Sometimes the relationship didn't just didn't go the way you planned on it going or the career choice or the career path. And God is saying, I have a plan for you. I have a path for you. And in that path is the good life. And so he's saying, I want you to, to, to go ahead and begin to structure yourself to finish how you started. Scripture says through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. Sometimes it's not the beginning of that thing or the end of that thing, but it's that in between time. It's the seasons that you deal with in between. Okay, I'm going for this thing. I believe I receive it. And then there's the promise manifested in my life. There's this thing called patience. There's this in between where you have peaks and valleys. There are things that happen in your life, things that come up, things un unexpected uh, stuff that hits that hits you. 
It could be a bad diagnosis from the doctor. It can just be the fact that, you know what, the car broke down on you, or you know what, you lost the job. Whatever it is, stuff happens, but how you handle it is going to determine that in-between part, how you manage the different seasons, the different doors that God opens, what are the things that you're going to do? And so you got to have a solid foundation. If I was to just sit down and counsel you right now, this, this is what I'm doing. If I sit down and counsel, number one, you're going to have to have your spiritual life intact, but also your mental life intact, because now you can be born again spiritually, and but now mentally, you got to be sharp. You got to build yourself. You got to know how to pivot when things happen and understand that life happens. So just because it didn't go out exactly how you planned it, don't lose yourself. Don't lose your mind. Don't lose momentum. Learn how to stop, reassess, reestablish, pivot, move. If you have to move in a different direction, move in a different direction. It's okay. And you got to give yourself space to, to know how to do that. Okay. Because sometimes you beat up yourself. You beat up yourself um, thinking that, you know what, this is my dream. This is what I believe success is. This is what you know, if I don't do this, if I don't have children by 30, if I don't, if I'm not the owner of a Fortune 500 company, if I don't have a car that I want, if I'm not living in the house with 2.5 kids and the husband or the wife who loves me, then I haven't made it. And you're putting undue pressure on yourself. So number one, you got to stop and say, God, what is it that you have for me? What is it that's my call? What's my lane? Because you can't look at other people, look at other people's assignments and assess your life based off of their calling. So you got to stop and say, okay, God, what is it that I'm supposed to do? Now, within those parameters, there are principles in your word that I can use to help me to achieve. I got to be led by your spirit because the Holy Spirit is there to help guide me to make wise choices and decisions. He'll show me things to come. He'll lead me. So my time in the presence of God, my time spent with the Holy Spirit, my time praying in tongues, building my spirit man up on a regular basis will help strengthen me. Because if you faint in the day of adversity, the Bible says your strength is small. And your strength is small because you're not feeding yourself, building yourself up on a continuous basis. So many people wait for something to happen before they start building themselves up. No, God says, get yourself built up because stuff is going to happen. Jesus even said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. So you're going to have to be ready. This is part of being a steward of your life, stewarding your mind. How, how do you think? Well, how do you process thoughts? And sometimes, so many times, we get off course just simply because our mind gets off course. And so when your mind gets off course, you will be led in the direction of your, your dominant thoughts. What are your dominant thoughts? That's leading you. And so sometimes it's simple as, you can have it in your spirit what you need to do, but if your head is so swamped with other things, before you know it, you start neglecting what the Holy Spirit and your born-again spirit is leading you to do, and then all of a sudden, you're getting off on some tangent, and before you know it, you're off course again. And then if you find this being a pattern in your life, it's like, okay, God, I got to break this cycle. What's the cycle that I need to break now? So now is the thing of, okay, find the plan or find, number one, the destination. Find the vision. What's the vision for your life? Find that. Find the purpose why God created you. And now you'll begin to see stuff you're supposed to do, stuff you're not supposed to do. Creativity comes. But then you got to know how to stay the course and say, even though the vision doesn't change or the mission doesn't change, the way in which you manifest it may change. And you got to be sensitive to that. That, okay, this door closed, so don't trip just because this door closed. There's another one because God will not leave you without a, out a door to the path that he has for you. Whether it's a detour, whether it's an exit strategy, whatever it is, he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. And he abides in you. And the Holy Ghost who has all wisdom lives in you. And you can know what you need to do. Sometimes you just need to see things in a different way to reignite your passion again, to get back on course, to do the thing that God called you to do. I was in, a, um, before I'm going to hit this scripture, I was in a, um, a meeting with a gentleman uh, the other day, and he was just doing some counseling for me and some uh, some consultation 
on some things. And as he was sharing something, all of a sudden I began to look at my life and ministry in a different way. And I told my wife, I was like, you probably already said this or maybe thinking about it differently. But it began to cause me to think about the level of impact in which we've already had. You know, because sometimes, you know, as a visionary, you see the great picture. You see far ahead. There's so much you want to accomplish. And if you don't watch it, you begin to minimize what God has already done in your life, which will cause you to mismanage the season that you're currently in. And that's part of being a bad steward. Sometimes understanding being in a pivoting season, being in, a, in an establishing season, being in an advancing season where you spent time laying a strong foundation, but God says, okay, you've already laid a strong foundation. Now it's time to advance the organization, the vision, the thing that you need to forward. So it's like, okay, you've learned what you need to learn. Now it's time to move forward. Now it's time to grow and develop in the thing I created and called you to do. Now I want to read this real quick. I want to go to book of Luke 14, the book of Luke 14. And I'm going to read verses 25 through 33, 25 through 33. And it says, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. <clears throat> and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower should have not down first. Let me go back here. I'm 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 a, I'm gonna I'm I'm stop here as I'm going through this real quick. He says, okay, first of all, if a man, verse 26, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. A disciple is a disciplined one. He's now when we talk about discipleship that we are now submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. And Jesus is teaching his disciples. In other words, in relation to you following me, I have to be first place. What I have for you has to be first place. And sometimes that's a big thing. That can mess up our stewardship, looking at everything there is around us and now not prioritizing correctly what needs to be done. So now it's just kind of one of those things of, hey, um, and, and I, I want to be, sometimes I like being transparent to give you practical examples, um, of things. So like, even as a father, even as I'm called to be a minister, so, and I'm called to be, um, a pastor, a leader, a teacher, a prophet to the nations, I'm called to train and to teach people who they are. I have to manage and steward my life in a way that I can fulfill my calling as a minister of a gospel that comes out and birthed out of my personal relationship with the Lord and then fulfilling what he's calling me to do, but also the requirements of being a good father, a good husband, a good leader, or whatever the case may be. So sometimes that may mean if my children have a track meet or uh, like my son guy has a track meet and I got to make sure I, I minister to the people that God has created and called for me. I want to make sure I'm a good steward over both that, hey, the way that I can do it, I can sit down, record a message. I can sit down, uh, just change up some times, adjust my schedule or say, hey, how do I manage, plan and steward my life in a way to meet both needs? But God is saying, Jesus is saying here, I need to be first place. So if you put me first place and start prioritizing your life accordingly, you'll find greater balance coming to your life and you'll begin to see that you'll start accomplishing more if you just structure your life in a way that pleases him. God first, God first. Then if you're married, your relationship with your spouse, then your relationship with your children, then you got to mix in there what you're called and created, your ministry, your calling, your career, things of that nature. So now the thing is, it's the balancing act. When you want to be a good steward, he says this, I got to see where your priorities lie first. Is your heart with me? If I tell you to go somewhere and it may contradict with this thing, you have to follow me. You have to do what I tell you to do. And then I'll make sure that I'll take care of everything else for you because that's been a big thing. And I see it with people who are successful, people who may be successful in business, but then also they're horrible at home. And so, yeah, to you, it looks like they're balling because they're making the money, but you don't know that their home is broken. Their lives are broken. Marriage has been destroyed. They can't sleep. They bought a house, but can't sleep in it. 
You, you see what I'm saying? So God is saying, I want you. And Jesus is saying here, let's go ahead. If you want to be my disciple, everybody else has to be secondary. Then you begin to prioritize everything else. So putting first things first, first things first. How is your relationship with the Lord? Does he have preeminence and priority in your life to help you steward to make wise choices and decisions? Because he may tell you to do something that contradicts what somebody else wants you to do. And it may hurt their feelings in that moment, but they'll have to get over it. Now, I'm not saying that to say it from a mean standpoint, but now that may mean you may have to communicate properly now with the other people in your life to say, this is what I believe the Lord is calling me to do. It does not mean I don't love you. It does not mean I won't be there for you. So if I do what I got to do to make sure that I still honor God and what I'm called to do, but also still love you and honor you as my family, as my spouse, my children, whatever the case is, whatever relationship it is, he's saying here, number one, God is coming first. But then two, you can still get some other things done. I, I remember... Uh, man of God who used to go out traveling and preaching, he'll go driving, he'll go and preach a message and then would drive almost in some cases 12, 15, 16 hours to get home just so that he can be there when they're kid with his, with his kids when they wake up to take them to school or to do whatever or to sit down and have dinner with his family because he still had a responsibility to be a father. He didn't want to leave um, his wife with that burden or the response, not the burden or the responsibility of raising the children and taking care of the home on their own. And so there was a point where the lady, the wife got to complaining to God because she got tired of her husband always being on the road and traveling and preaching. And she said, while she was washing dishes one day, all of a sudden, and I, and I don't know why this is coming up in me. I just thought about it. She said, all of a sudden, she heard in her spirit, she, she heard this, well, I could take him where he'd never come back to you. And she heard that, and later on, because the, the, the preacher was, um, he was going before God, and he was kind of complaining a little bit, the fact that he was missing his family or not being there for his family, but he knew that he was going to the places that the Lord was leading him. He was in this one particular church. His wife was there that day. And I think it was after a Sunday school or during a Sunday school session, he was in this ministry um, preaching at this church and he fell down in the pulpit. He was uh, sitting in a chair and he just passed out on stage and he had had this heart problem. His heart had stopped beating for a moment and he knew his heart was fluttering. His breath was rapid and he knew he felt as though that he was getting ready to die. All right. He knew in his spirit instantly that his wife had a part to play in what was going on with him. He told the people, go get my wife. The wife came and saw him and she instantly repented before God and said, Lord, please forgive me. She was like, no matter where you call him to go, I release him to do what you call for him to do. And she got her heart right with God. He said, okay, Lord, I'll do what you tell me to do and I'll do it without griping. He said instantly all symptoms left him and he got up completely healed. This Because of the calling that was on him, God required him to go to the nations. God required him to raise up his body. Because of the level of the calling that was on him, there was a great requirement. And sometimes we don't realize that it's like we. this is where communication comes in when you have a call on your life. And when, when you're called to do something, communication is going to be crucial. Now, this ain't in my notes, but this is just what I'm talking to you about, that sometimes what can happen is if you don't watch it, you can begin to resent God and resent the call because now of, because of the level of sacrifice that comes with it. And so this is why here, let's keep, let's keep going, because this is where counting the cost comes in. And he says this, he says, you can't be my disciple if you don't hate your father, your mother. He goes to that verse 27. And he says, whoever does not bear his cross come and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower said, if not down first, which of you uh, building the tower said, if not down first and count up the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it. Now, this is important. You got to count the cost of this thing. He said, at least happily after he have laid the foundation 
and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sit of not down first and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that come against him with 20,000? So um, then he says, Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he have, he cannot be my disciple. So you got to forsake it. He says, you got to count the cost. This is part of stewardship. Anytime you're stewarding, stewarding anything, you got to count the cost of what it is that you're doing. You got to be a good steward. You got to see what is it going to take for me to do this and that both and, or can I do both? Do I have to forsake one for the other? How do I manage? Because a steward is a manager of another's resources, asset, property. So now we're stewarding this life that's been given to us. And God is telling us, okay, there is required of a steward that you be faithful, be faithful to what I've told you to do. Sometimes you got to see, am I, do I have too much on my plate? How do I need to manage my life in order to get the results that I want to get? And so many people like to start a lot of things, but many people don't finish. And so he says, if you don't count the cost, you can start building something. And then if you don't finish it, then people can begin to mock you saying you started it, but couldn't finish it. We got a lot of starters, but not many finishers. It's not how you start, but how you finish. But in some cases, it is how you start. And I get, I, I get what people are saying. It's like, even though you might have had a bad start, you can have a strong finish. And so even with that, you may need to go back, even when it comes to, say, like when you get a house, if you see, if find a house and you see there's a crack in the foundation or something's wrong with the foundation, before you do anything else with that house, you need to correct the foundation because the foundation is the thing that it, the, the house sits on. So what is the foundation for your life? What are your values? What are your non-negotiables? What are things, even when you're going into a relationship, sometimes that'll help you make a decision whether you hook up with that man or that woman when you're stewarding your life because you understand what you're called to do. And if what that person is called to do does not match up with what you're called to do, the two of you don't need to connect because you're on two different roads. You're on two different paths. I don't care how fine he is, how fine she is. It does not matter because you won't be compatible because you weren't created to mesh together where... Um, your life is concerned, where calling is concerned, where longevity is concerned. And so you'll make each other miserable because you're being pulled in two different directions. And that means you weren't called to build a life together. Okay. So that's why it's important for you to understand who you are first. That's part of your personal foundation, understanding your identity, being comfortable in your own skin, understanding how God made you how he wired you so that now when you even meet somebody, it's easier to connect with somebody because you realize who they are matches or fits who I am. It doesn't mean we're the same, even from opposites. That's why opposites attract. There's certain strengths that you are admiring some people that are being created to eliminate the weaknesses in your life through covenant relationships. Okay. So you begin to see these things. So he's saying here, you need to begin to Okay, let's count the cost. Let's count the cost before we purchase the home. Let's count the cost before we move into this endeavor. What will it take? It doesn't mean I'm not supposed to do it. It just means I'm not, I'm not supposed to go into it blindly. In the sense of, I'm not talking about a faith step. I'm talking about when God has told you to do something, you know what it is you're supposed to do. What are the things that you can do to even prepare for that shift, prepare for that move? Sometimes the Holy Spirit may be warning you about something, and I want to use another word other than warning. He's letting you know ahead of time something's getting ready to shift in your life and you need to prepare for it. You need to prepare yourself. Whether it is you, you felt a strong urge to start saving, you felt a strong urge to start doing something because whether it's an economic shift that was getting ready to take place, and he wanted to make sure that you were strong financially and stable. So this is being a good steward. When he says start putting money away, start investing in this, this is part of stewardship because you're being led by the Spirit of God. He's showing you what to do ahead of time so that now you won't find yourself in a place where you're struggling, where you could be flourishing even in the midst of famine. Okay? 
So now this is stewardship. I have to be in tune with God first and foremost. What is it that you want me to do? I don't want to make a move without you, God, because this is your stuff. My life is yours now. Even my resources are yours because if my life is yours and everything that you bless me with is already here, you've given to me, this is yours as well. What do I do with it? So it's going to be very important that we begin to say, okay, God, show me what to do here. This is where the systems, the strategy, the structure in your life that you set certain things in place to even help you. What does God say about your family? What does God say about your money? What does God say about your business? So let's we'll look at that even more so as we go on later in this in this series. What does he say? Because if we understand, submit yourself to the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added. So there's a system, there's a remedy, there are principles, because we call this series, yes, it's stewardship, but we call it from principle to power. In other words, you're functioning in principles, and it'll produce the power of the results if we just stay the course. And I pray that God gives you strength to stay the course, to do the things that you're supposed to do. So whatever it is, even in the area of your spiritual life, the area of your soul, what do you do to have a healthy soul, for you to be mentally stable, for you to be spiritually stable? One of the things that's spiritually stable is to feed off the word of God, which is spiritual food for the spirit man. The Holy Spirit abides in you. Not only, watch this, you feed your spirit. Watch this, when you get understanding of the word and it enters in, the interest of God's word giveth light, enlightenment. So when it enters, and it enters even through you understanding, hearing, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. But with that word hearing is a level of comprehension and understanding of what you're hearing. And so now meditation on the word begins to help digest or break down what the scripture means. Even when you begin to think on a rhema word, when God speaks to your spirit and you begin to dwell on what he's speaking, all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, God, what do you mean by this? Before I make this decision, okay, does this mean this? Okay, help me, give me more clarity on this. I know this is what I heard, but now help me so that I can make a wise choice or decision here. And now God is also giving you practical wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to know that, okay, I can at least do some of these practical things that'll help sustain me. Um, you know, if God is, you, you know, God is leading you to go somewhere or to do something. You, you, you. <laughs> You hear the word Africa, but all of a sudden, that don't mean God called you to move to Africa. It may not even mean that God called you to be a missionary to Africa. He just might He might want you to just support a missionary who's going to Africa. I don't know what it is, but when you hear something from God, don't be so quick to jump the gun. Give it time to grow. Give it time to unpack. Give it time for you to get more understanding on it. Now, you might want to research some things, or if you're feeling this, though, I remember I remember I was about 22, 23 years old. I might have been 22 at the time, or 23. Um, and I remember writing down on paper um, my house. And I was believing for a house because I, I was living with my parents, but I just felt like it was time to make a shift or something was about to shift in my life. And I remember I was talking to a friend of mine and we had talked about um, uh, becoming roommates possibly becoming roommates. I remember my mom talking to me. It was like, you know what, Mike? I don't think you're supposed to... She called me Michael. She, always, she never calls me Mike. She always calls me Michael. She she said, I don't think that you really should do that. She was like, either you'll leave out on your own or it'll be when you get married. I don't know if she told me it'll be when I get married, but it was like she just didn't feel like that was the right move for me at that time. And I received the wisdom. And she was right. <laughs> she was right. But what God, but watch this, watch what began to happen. I told her, I said, I feel as though by the age of 24, I'm supposed to be, I'll be moved or something. I told her. And I remember my aunt, I think she told me later that even my aunt, she told my aunt about one of my aunts about the conversation. And my aunt was like, yeah, so go ahead and get ready. Yep. I believe that's right. God is already dealing with it. So it's almost like get ready. Cause that's going to be it. And sure enough, I got married when I was 24. I met my wife. Uh, I might have been late 22, 22, going into 23 years old. We were friends for about a, actually about a year and a half, almost dated for a half a year, um, a year, almost a year. It wasn't even a full year we dated. 
And then I proposed to her. Because really, I told her how I felt about on, um, what was it, March the 29th of 1998. I proposed to her on July the 13th, I think it was. We got married December 19th, all in that same year. But we were friends for about a year and a half prior to. So we got to know each other. But I just sensed in my heart it was time for me to get married because the even the desire to get married was rising up in me. And I was starting to look. I was looking at different women's like, and just people is like, okay, what are the qualities and characteristics? Because I just felt in my spirit, in my heart. Then plus I just had a desire. I was a single man. I was keeping myself for marriage. And so it was just one of those things. But I felt like it was time. So, you know, with that, you got to start making adjustments. Now, a good adjustment would have been, watch this, was to just start putting money aside, start building up a nest egg, putting things in reserve, knowing that, and that's just a practical thing anyway that you do. I ain't got to be led by the spirit of God to do it. I just know, you know, you just hear things where financial advisors say three to six months of expenses or or maybe just have a certain amount because at that time since I was living with my parents I didn't have any particular I had a couple of expenses which was very minimal gave some money towards the household was paying for a car you know and that was about it you know didn't have a lot of responsibility but God was preparing me and so when you see that this is part of stewardship how do I start structuring myself to get ready for certain shifts in my life I know I'm at a place now. There's some basic things you can do. There's just some basic things, you know, learning how, you know, if you feel as though you're supposed to move out on your own, learning how to manage yourself, learning how to conduct business, learning how to steward finances, learning how to steward relationships, learning how to make decisions, learn how to be a good decision maker. Because there's sometimes there's a group that now is like, you know, even there's some people maybe that's younger, there's some that's older that don't make wise choices because they were never taught how to make a wise choice or decision. And so if anything violates the word of God or violates the peace of your heart and your mind, then you need to, to pump the brakes until you get a go ahead to say, you know what, I feel as though this is what I'm supposed to do. And so this is part of the stewardship life. This is part of the counting costs. So if I was to move and now how would that affect this? If I was to leave and go over here, how would it affect that? So now, if God, you call me to do this and an opportunity presented itself over here, then watch this. If God called me to a ministry that's here locally, but then I get a job offer in China somewhere, that just don't match up. Because if God called me to a particular place, that's where his provision will be for my life. So I won't. E- it won't even be a hard choice for me to reject the offer because I know where I'm called to. See, wherever God guides, he provides. And so then what Satan will try to do is try to get you off track and get you out of the the, the path for your life by presenting you with something that'll draw you away from the purpose and the plan of God for your life. So it just, just, whatever the case is, you got to stay, say, okay, God, you're preeminent, you're first place. And I hope I'm, I'm getting across to you but some of you may need to hear this this way and just ask the ask God the question, what is it that you want me to do now? How can I go about doing it that does not, number one, violate your word, violate principles of your word, and then two, does not violate the character of my heart, which is my born-again spirit who, with the Holy Spirit who abides in me, with the fruit of the spirit that's leading me so I know, hey, I can make a wise choice and decision here. So God, I want to steward well what you have because you give me the ability to do so. So I want you to begin to count the cost of things. Count the cost should you join this organization. Count the cost can you commit to a particular thing because of maybe just the season that you're in. It's okay that you got to make an assessment. Can I handle added responsibility? If not, because I don't want to now, because since I didn't count the cost and just said yes to anything, now all of a sudden I can't finish it. Now that affects my integrity or character and my reputation of being a person who starts but doesn't finish, that they don't have a truly committed heart, or they ain't serious because they ain't committed, they ain't doing this. No, they may have a heart towards God and to do what's right. They just didn't know how to say no. They just didn't know how to assess where they currently were at that time and to say, you know what, I really want to do it, but right now, because of what's happening here, man, I just can't commit to it at this time. 
And that's cool. And that's okay. And so now, because you got to make sure that you have time to properly assess and dissect what you're dealing with and now say, okay, God, what's a good thing for me to do? You, you got to note it. Um, and I, I'm going to get ready to finish with this. Um, I remember years ago, um, this was right after, right before my daughters were born. My dad passed away. He had an aneurysm. They rushed him to the hospital. Um, it was actually on my mom's birthday that he actually went to the hospital. He died the next day. And so I remember during that time, we had already, we were planning for a youth conference at the church that we were part of. And so we were part of it singing and, and doing things. And so I remember one night, this was after my dad had passed. Um, some of my family was at my mom's house. And so I think I had taken my wife over there and she was pregnant with the girls at the time, but she was at the house with my mom and I think maybe a couple of other people. But I remember that particular night, my brothers and I, we went to church to rehearse because we were like, you know what, we're going to serve God. Even though our dad had just died, it was a sudden thing. Um, there were people that were there with my mom. You know, we were there. We were doing other things that we needed to do. But it was like, you know what, we're going to serve God. It's like, we looked at it like this. Satan, since you put this attack and snatched him out of this place like this, you know what, we're going to put a hurting on you. We're going to serve God. We're going to give glory to God in the midst of this thing. Whereas some may say, you know what, I just need some time away. You know what? No, we, man, we just had the attitude. It was like, okay, we believe he was with the Lord. He had already given his life to Christ. We knew it. We found out about it. Uh, that might have been later we found out about that, but we just knew we had peace about it. Everything was good. My mom was good. You know, my wife was good and everything. So it was like, no, we're going to serve God. We're going to go do this thing and, and give glory to God even in the midst of it. Those are moments like that where sometimes it may be hard to go and follow through with calling, to go and follow through with what God called you to do, but he'll give you strength to do it. And so even no matter where you are, if you feel as though, and I'm going to end with this, if you feel as though that you got off course in any way, shape, fashion, or form, <clears throat> you can reassess where you currently are, count the cost of where you are, build from where you are, utilize what you have. Remember, God going to bless what's in your hands. But you got to recognize what you have, give thanks for what you have, and then begin to say, okay, God, give me wisdom to maneuver and to utilize what I currently have in my hands to get to the destination you have for me. I might have squandered it in the past, and I might not have been a good, you know, a, a, a good steward in the past. And I don't want to be like that person. And some of you may have been like that person. Um, in Matthew 25, you might've been that one talent that the master took it from him and gave it to the one with the five because he knew how to handle more. And then it's, it's hurt you that you had a missed opportunity. But I pray that God will give you new opportunities to prove and to show your faithfulness to him now. And to say, God, even though I messed up then, I'm going to make up for it now. I'm going to learn whatever skill sets I got to learn to be a good steward. I got to trust my heart. I have to forgive myself from bad decisions and choices. Okay, everybody's made bad choices and decisions. We've all made mistakes. So stop beating yourself up by mistakes in the past and allow the joy of the Lord to shine forth and for you to move forward and go forward. So I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you begin to finish strong. You're going to finish right and you're going to finish strong in Jesus' name. So I declare God's wisdom, God's grace, God's favor, God's resources, his wealth and abundance, his support system around you, that they will help you achieve and accomplish what you have been created and called by God to do. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. Praise God. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this time in your presence. I pray right now that you surround your people with faith and love. And so we just bless you and thank you for it now. Now, maybe those that are out there tonight, that have never made Jesus the Lord of their life. Let them know that there's a literal heaven to gain and the hell to shun in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Now, there may be some of you out there tonight that you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. I just want to introduce you to this Christ. I want you to, I want you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the beginning of all things. He is the beginning, the preeminent. This is where your life will start till you begin to live the life God called you to live, okay, by having the nature of God abide in you. If that's you, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Christ, the son of the living God. I believe that you died for me, 
I believe that you were raised from the dead for me. Come inside my heart now, Lord Jesus. I make you the Lord of my life. Say, Satan, I no longer belong to you. Jesus is my Lord, and I'll serve only him all the days of my life. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving me your son. I'm saved now. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, y'all, I encourage you to finish strong. For those that have gotten born again, let us know. Send us a message. There's information coming up on your screen. You can send us an email at connect at spiritoffire.us, connect at spiritoffire.us. You can also send us a message on our social media platforms as to how um, you know, to connect and how to now grow as a Christian. We want to help you grow and develop in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. At this time, we're going to honor God in our giving. Um, there's information coming up on your screen, different means and methods in which you can sow and the plan and support the work that God is doing here with us, through us, and in us. And so there's a QR code that's coming up on your screen where you can just, um, it'll take you, you can scan it, It'll take you to a secure page where you can give and you can sow as the Lord leads, guides, and directs. As you give, it'll be given to you again. We believe that good measure pressed down, shaking together and running over, that God will cause men to give into your bosom. He says this, even if for those that are tithers, he says he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. The windows of heaven are open upon your life. And we just declare and decree that all things are working together for your good. As you give, he says, you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. God says, I love a cheerful giver, a happy, hilarious, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in their giving. And so we just thank God for you and your continued financial support of this work that God has called us to do. Praise God. So even as you're doing it, as you're sowing, we're in faith with you, in agreement with you. For every need to be met, every bill to be paid in full, you owe no man anything but to love him. We declare restoration in your life. We declare right now, even that God will grant you wisdom in your stewardship journey, that as a steward, it's required that you be found faithful, but now being found faithful is being dedicated and committed to the process of what it is you're supposed to do on a regular day in, day out basis. It's your daily agenda that determines even your success level. What are the new rhythms that God is calling you to walk in? Faithfulness, whether it's, you know, setting a time to get up and pray, you know, you know, if you function in the principle of prayer now, the timing of prayer can vary. You can do it at night. You can do it in the morning. You can do it midday. The thing is that you pray. So it's like, and see, that's the principle of prayer. Now that goes into now or the practice of the principle. The practice of the principle can sometimes vary. So, but it's still you being faithful with being committed to doing it on a regular basis. Okay. So I'll share a little bit more in the future about that. Just, I mean, you know, if you have any more, uh, if you have any questions, you can let me know. It's like even pertaining to this message. I got a question. I want you to do that. I want you to do it. You can send me an email. You can email us at info at spiritoffire.us um, or send us a message. You know, I, I love to just, you know, you may have a, a question as to, okay, that pertains to your specific situation. I just feel that I can do that, you know, to do that right now. You know, open that up to you all. If there's an area that you may have a question about, there's something that, okay, God, how do I steward this area of my life in this season of my life? I want to help you. I want to be a blessing to you in any way that I can. If I can help you, I will. And so to say, okay, to give you counsel and wisdom to know how to do what God called you to do. Amen. All right, y'all. I'm out of time, but certainly not out of message. I declare and decree the wisdom, the favor, the grace, and the glory of God upon your life. I declare right now that all things are working together for your good. I declare peace upon your life in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you all, and i see you next time. Oh, before I go, before I go, we're going to be sending out a, a message, a net message, but I don't know if it's already going out yet. I don't think it has. But we are adjusting our schedule, our in-person schedule for the month of um, April. We will not be in person this Sunday. This is the first Sunday in April. We're switching because I wanted us to be in person for Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, which is the second Sunday in April. So we will be in person on the second and fourth Sunday in April. So I want to make sure that I make that announcement to you. We will not be in person. We will be virtual this Sunday. Okay? So I just want to let everybody know that so you can plan and prepare accordingly. Okay? Love you guys. 
See you next time. Peace.